This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I, I don't administer a lot of these. The boss does that. So, um, but welcome. Um, uh, Ed and the, from the chamber and I wanted to, to assemble with the businesses uh, to pass on some information. Um, things are different than May 29th. I turned the heater on in my car. I refused to turn the furnace on at home. I, I try to hold out till November, but it might be a little cold October this year. Um, uh, I'm Russ Willie. I think most of you know me. Um, we've, we've met either in this format or I've met you on the street in St. Peter here, um, but welcome. Um, you know, we, we, we did a swing in the mist with the pool. Uh, it was a delayed opening, it was open, and then it was forced to shut because of, of, of the COVID situation. Um, but the city's business never sleeps is what I'd like to say. And, and uh, we're still making some progress on a number of things. Um, we'll be talking uh, very soon with the city council about an, a 66 unit apartment complex being planned for the uh, north, very north end of the Traverse Green subdivision. Um, you know, we've, we've got the budget um, well in hand for, for 2021. Um, and if the budget's adopted, if you own a $150,000 house in St. Peter and your value didn't change uh, due to a, a, an assessor's action, your taxes will actually go down about 63 cents. So um, uh, that, that's, uh, that's better than a raise. So um, we're trying to be very prudent. Um, the, uh, you, you've probably seen on the north end, Anytime Fitness under construction, um, as we'd say in Fairmont Caddy Corner from where they had been in the old Ford shop. Uh, Marcy Lorenz is on and her and her husband, Jamie, uh, undertaken the uh, renovation and then some improvements and some repairs to the old, old, old fire station that they've purchased. So uh, things are still happening. Um, and, uh, um, we're we're, uh, we're glad to, to be able to take care of your business and, and to keep the town running. So um, at this point, I'm gonna just turn it over to Ed really, really briefly to, to give a welcome and he'll be talking later on about the marketing efforts and what's going on at the chamber. So Ed. Uh, welcome everybody, it's great to see you. Um, thanks for making time this morning. Uh, I think the messages are really important. This might be the greatest, biggest opportunity to come down the pike. Um, thanks so much to Ryan at Nicola County and uh, the Nicola County Board, Marie, you're on, um, for administering these CARES dollars and helping businesses in this way. Like I say, I think it's a really big opportunity and we are just out with the shoe leather trying to get into businesses and tell them one-on-one -on -one directly that, uh, there's some money that could be coming their way that they don't have to pay back. In no uncertain terms, we wanna be really clear about that, that uh, this is an amazing opportunity. So yep. take it back, Russ. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, and, and we'll get to, to your marketing efforts a little bit later. Um, uh, Ryan Crush is the county administrator. He's been on the job a number of years now, probably longer than I think. Um, he replaced Bob Potteroski when Bob retired. Um, so um, the county has put together um, what they're calling the Nicollet County Cares Business Relief Grant. And the operative word in that title is grant. Um, and it should always be in capital letters, I think. Um, so we've invited Ryan to come give you a little basis of, of, of what the program involves. Um, maybe maybe the, the source of the funding and a couple of things to just get you teed up. Um, as I said in the invitation, they're gonna have two informational um, seminars that'll be held on a virtual format. Um, and uh, they'd like you to pre-register for them. I think the space might be limited, um, but they'll also be posting them on their website after after they record them. So Ryan Crush, welcome to our, our uh, assembly and you have the floor. All right, thank you, Russ. And good morning, everybody. Um, what I'll do here is just give a little background uh, on the program, and then uh, I'll be happy to open it up for questions uh, afterwards. So Nicollet County um, is part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which is better known as the CARES Act, uh, that was passed by Congress in March. Uh, that was a $2 trillion economic relief plan, and in that $2 trillion, 150 billion went to local governments across the country uh, to reimburse those local governments for costs incurred by the pandemic and then to also uh, help with 
pushing funds back out into the community where there's need uh, that was created due to the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, uh, Nicollet County's share of that uh, was $4.1 million we received in July. Uh, the county board has decided on an initial budget um, to take about half of that uh, to reimburse ourselves for costs that we've incurred. As many of you know, uh, the county is really on the front line of the pandemic uh, uh, here in Nicollet County with our public health department. So we've incurred a tremendous amount of cost, but um, we are uh, also budgeting half of it, so a little over 2 million uh, to put back out into the community. Uh, we have various programs up and running already, uh, providing PPE to businesses or really anybody who needs it. Um, uh, housing assistance, daycare assistance, uh, those types of things. I encourage everybody to look at our website. Uh, that's where everything related to the CARES Act funding programs is located. Uh, and that's uh, www.co.nicklet.mn.us. Um, of the $2 million that we're trying to push back out into the community, uh, 1 million of that has been dedicated uh, to this uh, business grant program that we're gonna talk about here today. Uh, and I'll go through the overview. Again, the overview is on our, our website as well. Um, uh, and I'll hit on some of the high points here. Uh, so this is a grant, like Russ said, uh, there's no repayment terms unless we were to find that uh, uh, there was fraudulent information provided or that type of thing, but we're, we're not concerned about that. Uh, grants of up to $10,000 will be provided um, uh, to businesses uh, that have one to 20 full-time equivalent employees. And uh, the grants um, are for eligible expenses, which I'll get into here shortly. We're also providing um, grants of up to $5,000 to businesses without employees. So self-employed self persons, uh, sole proprietors, home-based businesses, that sort of thing. Uh, eligible expenses. So uh, each applicant needs to document in their application uh, the eligible expenses that you incurred uh, during a period from March 1st to August 31st of 2020. Uh, and that list includes uh, rent payments, mortgage payments, uh, insurance, utilities, payments to suppliers, vendors, uh, PPE costs, costs with reopening your business due to the pandemic, uh, temporary COVID costs related to restrictions of business activity and increased technology. It's a pretty comprehensive list. Um, that uh, we're providing to give uh, businesses options to uh, claim those expenses. And um, what you'll have to do on the application is uh, document that with uh, paid invoices or receipts or that sort of thing. Um, uh, and then what happens there is that uh, uh, we'll add up the total. And let's say you're, you're eligible for a $10,000 grant if you had $6,000 worth of eligible expenses, uh, that's the grant that you would, would receive. Uh, this program is for for-profit and not-for-profit businesses. Um, not-for-profit businesses must have at least one full-time employee. Uh, again, I mentioned not more than uh, 20 full-time equivalent employees, and on our application, we spell out how to uh, calculate full-time equivalent uh, employees. Businesses have to be operate have had to be operating by March 1st, uh, be in good standing uh, with the city on all your licenses, and in good standing uh, with the Secretary of State's office. Um, and the, the the two key criteria to be eligible, uh, you must fall under one of these uh, uh, two items. You either have to be a business that was partially or fully shut down. Uh, due to one of the governor's executive orders during the pandemic, or you have to experience, had to have experienced a reduction in gross revenues of 25% or greater for two calendar months between March 1st and August 31st of this year, as compared to the same calendar months uh, in the year prior. And again, you would have to provide some sort of uh, documentation with your application uh, to show that uh, revenue loss. So. Those are really the two key pieces you have to qualify for this is you have to uh, 
uh, either have had to close down due to a governor's order or show us that you had a 25% uh, reduction in revenue for two months. Uh, there's several businesses that uh, are not eligible and that's in the, in the criteria on our website. Uh, you can read that um, uh, at, your, at your leisure. Uh, ineligible expenses uh, include payroll expenses. We're not reimbursing for payroll expenses. Um, and the grant amount can't be previously uh, reimbursed by another federal or state program. So if you um, received the state deed grant and submitted eligible expenses for that, uh, you can't submit those same expenses for our grant program. Or if you received the PPP loan and then it covered your rent expenses for a couple of those months, you can't submit those same months um, for our program. And again, that's all spelled out uh, in, our, in our information online. Um, so the documentation required, uh, you'll have to complete an online application. We're only accepting online applications and we've hired uh, a third party consultant, uh, Baker Tilly, they're a large uh, municipal financial consultant across the country. Um, they're uh, building uh, the application as we speak and they'll have that run through their portal. Uh, they'll be receiving all the information and doing the initial review to determine uh, the basic eligibility requirements and then providing us uh, with those who submitted applications that, that are eligible and that are not eligible. Um, the documentation that you'll attach with your application um, will have to provide, you'll have to provide certificates of incorporation uh, to show that you're official business here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, documentation uh, showing the number of employees uh, in your organization, if you have employees. Uh, an income and expense statement for two calendar months between March and August, showing that 25% revenue reduction. Um, that you only have to provide that information if you do not qualify under being under the portion that or the requirement that says uh, you're eligible uh, doing due to being shut down uh, from one of the governor's uh, orders. So if you were shut down during from one of the governor's orders, you don't have to provide that documentation on revenue laws. Um, and then again, you'll have to provide invoices or statements uh, substantiating the eligible expenses that you're claiming for the grant. Uh, IRS form W-9 to, uh, will be required to accept payment. Uh, that's not required with the application. Uh, should you be awarded a grant, you'll have to provide the W-9 um, uh, at that time. And then there's potential if we have questions or need additional documentation, we'll, we'll ask for that uh, individually on a case by case basis. Uh, the grant application period um, uh, starts Monday, September 14th and runs until 4.30, October 2nd. Uh, and we anticipate uh, uh, awarding funds in October. Uh, one other note here, Nicola County will issue grant recipients an IRS form 1099 as these funds are taxable. And Russ mentions uh, we are having uh, informational sessions uh, starting next week. Our consultant uh, is, is putting those on. Uh, they're all virtual online sessions. Uh, the first one is Wednesday, September 16th at 12 noon. And the second one is Thursday, September 24th at 9 a.m. You can register for those online at our website. Uh, and then any questions uh, as you go through this, um, you can contact uh, myself or our finance director, Heather McCormick, and our contact information is online. So with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that uh, folks may have about this. Yeah, wow, thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm sure there's got to be a question. That was a lot of information. And and uh, again, it's gonna, it's recorded, so we'll try to get this on the city's YouTube page, um, hopefully even as early as later this afternoon. Um, but if, if anyone has a question for Ryan, most of you don't have your cameras on and, and uh, I, you know, the beauty parlors and barbers are open, so I don't understand all that. But uh, um, if you have a question, Joey, I see your mic's open. Joey Halsibus. 
I do. I was curious. So, how is the formula used to determine the eligible expenses? I mean, how do you uh, come up with your value up to ten thousand dollars? Okay, so um, if you go online and look at our program overview, uh, it gives um, the full list of eligible expenses, and it'll also be on the application as well. So. Um, what you would have to do, and you can keep it as simple as you want. Let's say you have uh, five mortgage payments that you've made um, in that six month period. You would just have to submit uh, your mortgage statements um, for that period as documentation of, a, of an expense. And uh, that would and get you to that $10,000 amount. Um, if you have twenty thousand dollars worth of expenses or whatever, you don't need to submit everything. Just whatever you need to get you to that ten thousand dollar amount. I had one business contact me from North Mankato, and they've got a lot of smaller expenses, expenses at Menards for PPE and glass and that type of thing. And he said he may have over a hundred invoices to submit to get him to that five thousand dollar threshold that he's eligible for. And I said that's that's what you'll have to do. So. Um, just submit your invoices to get you to that total of uh, $10,000 and uh, make sure you're following the eligible expense list on the application and that should be all you have to do. Joey, did you have a follow-up? Nope, that, uh, that answer, just so it, uh, cause it's one for one minute sounds like. Correct, yep, dollar, dollar for dollar. So if you had, uh, $10,000 worth of mortgage payments or $5,000 worth of mortgage payments and uh, $5,000 worth of utility payments. Um, of course, you wouldn't have that in St. Peter, would we? Uh, $5,000 worth of utility payments. Um, uh, if you, yeah, it's dollar for dollar. So any combination of the eligible expenses uh, is, will qualify you. Thank you, Ryan. Jane S., your microphone is on. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. So my, my business is primarily in the fall, and I'm just a, uh, I go to craft shows and things, and they're all canceled. So this is kind of part of my yearly income, and I have, like, none to go to. The maker fair is canceled. Both, all the county fairs were canceled. Everything is canceled. So there goes my business, there goes my income for the year. Um, and, and then my daughter, I would have a question for her. She, uh, she manages the Renaissance and she does have a bunch of employees that she manages, but that's also gonna be very slim to nothing. I mean, I, I think they're gonna be, I, she told me the last time I talked to her, she said they're only gonna be open for three weekends and it's gonna be a drive-through. So, uh, and she's selling one item. So um, her employees are not going to get anything either. And she's losing like $40,000 uh, is what she normally gets that she pays her employees that she's not going to get. So um, I'm curious what, um, I'm curious what kind of uh, income comes to those, those people that just have a yearly or a seasonal kind of business, you know? Yeah, so are you sole proprietors or set up as actual businesses and is the business a primary source of income? Well, her Renaissance business is is not her sole business. She just she's just a manager for about 12 bases there and she has uh, employees, probably 20 or 30 employees that that work for her at the Renaissance. You know, which is not going to happen. And me, I just, I'm my own person. I make my own things and I go to craft events and I set up, take down, um, you know, but there, there just isn't any craft shows this year for me. So I'm losing, I'm losing income too. Yeah. So uh, what you have to show, um, you have to be, uh, if you're a self-employed person, a sole proprietor, that type of thing, home-based business, uh, that job has to be your primary source of income. And um, maybe ask, you have to certify that on the application, and then we may ask you to provide additional documentation to show that that's 
your craft business is your primary source of income. Um, and then you would have to document um, that uh, uh, you had a reduction of 25% uh, of revenue in that time frame that I indicated of March 1st to August 31st. Uh, I know that most of the craft shows and the Renaissance are outside of that period. So um, those are the criteria you'd have to meet to uh, be eligible for this uh, uh, program. Um, if we get enough situations uh, where it occurs where you don't qualify um, and we have funds available, there's a chance we would come back with another round of grants later this fall um, and try to address issues that were maybe missing with this program, but I can't say for sure that will happen. So um, but that, that's the criteria for, for this round is you would have to uh, show us that it's your primary source of income and then show us that you've lost 25% of your revenue in that time frame. Yep. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, my, yeah, my sales are pretty much in the fall. Yep. Yeah, Jane, your situation is really, really unique. So maybe it would be better to follow up with a phone call um, once the county gets everything up and running and, and, uh, and maybe they can figure out if they can address your situation. But I know as with the city put our loan together, we, you've got to have guidelines and you've got to have eligibility. And, and unfortunately, we knew our program wasn't going to be able to touch everybody also. So it's, it's, it's unfortunate, um, but uh, perhaps a, a phone call um, to the county number um, might be better to address your individual situation. Um, Aaron, you said you had a question. Is it Aaron Craw? Craig. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I actually have just uh, two quick questions. My first one is, um, Ryan, you had mentioned as far as the, the initial eligibility that it was obviously for businesses and uh, not for profits. I just wanted to clarify, do 501c3 nonprofit organizations, are they also eligible? Yes, correct. Uh, uh, really any any uh, nonprofit uh, registered with the Secretary of State in Minnesota that's in good standing mm -hmm. is going to be eligible. Uh, we're not concerned if you're a C3, C6 or whatever number it is. Um, but you do have to have at least one full-time employee to qualify. Got it. And so that's my second question, actually, um, because you had talked about the 1 to 20 FTEs. Is that measured at the at the time of the application or is that measured during that March to August time frame? Because we have a situation where the organization was closed for you know an extended period of time due to COVID. Um, and so obviously we had a, an incredible reduction of employees that went on leave of absence and you know we're drawing unemployment. I'm just wondering how that affects the application process. Yeah, so what we're um, requiring for documentation on employee numbers is um, your state of Minnesota payroll form 941 or IRS form W3. Um, and Marie can maybe help me with this or the state of Minnesota unemployment report detailing your employees. And we're requesting those um, can come from calendar year uh, 2019, fourth quarter, uh, 2019 or first quarter 2020. So it's going to be your employees um, in those time frames uh, that we that we'll be using. Marie, I see. Uh, so, oh, oh, sorry, Aaron. Oh, sorry. So if there, so if, for an example, you know, if we're talking pre-COVID, you know, the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, if we had 20 uh, full-time employees, up to up to 20 full-time employees, I should say then we would be fine for that uh, component of the criteria. Yeah, if you can show us documentation on one of those uh, forms that you have to submit doc to the state documenting your employee counts, um, if you can show us that uh, uh, really pre-COVID, pre-March uh, 1st, uh, that's, that's all we'll need to see. Okay. Marie, Wonderful, that was very helpful. Did Marie? I get that, Marie? <laughs> <coughs> it's the pre-COVID numbers, but we also want to um, stress that the business needs to be located in Nicollet County. So uh, the previous question about the Renaissance, it, it seems to me that might not be located in Nicollet County. 
Um, one other Please. clarification, Ryan. Um, in 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 one instance, you were talking about 20 full-time equivalents, and then you said nonprofit has to have a full-time employee. So they have to have one employee at least with 20, 80 hours a, a year. It can't be one full-time equivalent. Yeah, they have to have one full-time equivalent um, as a nonprofit to qualify. And the reason for that is there's so many nonprofits out there that don't have um, employees, clubs, organizations, various things that, you know, have. I'm on several of them that lost revenue during this, couldn't have banquets or whatever. But uh, we're trying to focus our efforts on uh, uh, businesses that uh, – and nonprofits that have employees. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Dustin, I see you're on, and then I'll go to Jerry after Dustin's question. Go ahead, Sounds Dustin. Sounds good. Morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. You guys hear me? Yep. 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 Okay. So my question is, is that I was a sole proprietor for, I don't know, quite a few years, and I was doing my business part-time out of my home. And... Uh, this year i'd open up the shop and i'm actually doing this full time now and the reason for that was is because i ended up having a huge abundance of work well then COVID hit which also or crippled the economy as well too and things just dried up so for me just being here for like three months how could i even qualify for this so when did you uh, uh how long has your business been established your sole proprietorship well, I'm an LLC now, and that just happened last year because I knew I was going to be opening up a shop. So I've been in this location, which is the first location I've ever been in. Uh, I think it's going on three months now. So it would have been August, June, July, I think is when I got in here. So, but you were operating, um, you were operating in a different location in Nicollet County before that? No, I was in Mankato. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a good question on how we want to address that one. Um, why don't you, why don't you get in touch with me and we'll okay. chat a little bit. Uh, as Russ mentioned, um, these programs are not perfect because there's so many situations out there that, uh, we have to address, but we have to come up with some criteria somehow, but, um, so we know we're going to have situations that we got to sit back and take a look at. So. Uh, yeah, get a hold of me. My contact information is all online, so uh, we'll, we'll talk. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Jerry, go ahead. So I still have a question on the employee thing. So it's for employees one up to twenty, but not above twenty. Correct. Not above okay. twenty. Okay, got it. Twenty full time equivalents. It could be thirty people, but you. You assemble the hours, correct? Correct. We have, uh, yeah, we have way more than that. So, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Joel Stencil, you had your microphone on. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just looking at this, and you know, we we talked about, and I'm building on this employee piece. So I'm wondering how we're going to justify with a 941 or a W3 full-time equivalents because you don't report full-time equivalents on those forms, you report employees. And then I have another question after that one. I'm gonna look to my uh, one of my bosses and one of my tax advisors, Marie Tranel on that. Um, I think the main purpose, and I've, I can't recall how those forms all look, but uh, I think the main purpose is we want to just see some documentation that um, businesses are being truthful and honest to us about their employee counts. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to sit there and count every person every hour, but uh, Marie, do you, can you add anything to that? I'm guessing Baker Tilly is going to ask for unemployment reports that, that detail hours and gross wages and employee counts. Yeah, if if we, I mean, if we if we think it's it's close or um, questionable, we'll follow, we'll end up following up with the business to say provide us additional documentation. Okay, thank you. Joel, you had another question. I did. Thank you. And then, can you expand on fully or partially suspending operations? Uh, yeah. Hang on one second here. 
I believe that's in our ineligible business list. Ryan, oh, you're stuck. I thought maybe you froze up on us. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm sitting, sorry, I'm sitting here reading. Uh, I, Joel, is that uh, the part about businesses suspended or debarred from doing work with the federal government, or where are you seeing that? Um, so I was looking at businesses must demonstrate and experience business interruptions or were adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic by fully or partially suspending operations in 2020 on those two criteria, either that or you would have experienced a gross revenue loss of 25% or more. Okay, yep. So that I'm I'm just wondering how we're defining fully or partially suspending. Is that mean we close the doors and we ask people to work from home or what what does that mean by definition? Yeah, um, now I'm following you here. So under the governor's uh, stay at home orders that he issued, um, if you were required uh, to fully uh, shut down your business, close the doors, or like I, I take for example, a restaurant. Restaurants were still able to do drive up and curbside pickups, but they couldn't have indoor seating. So I'm considering that a partial uh, closure due to governor, the governor's order. So if you were in one of those two situations due to the governor's executive orders for stay at home, uh, that's how you qualify under that. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I, that's what I was assuming, Ryan. It, it was, you know, the the uh, the bars, restaurants, uh, uh, salons and spas, and those types of businesses, fitness centers, um, uh, public assembly, the ones that you know the governor said no, you got to shut down, and then they turned the dial and they were slowly able to reopen. So. Um, yep. Uh, is there any other questions? Just turn your microphone on and I'm gonna ask one more time, like an auctioneer. Ryan, Marie, thank you very much. Marie, please thank your colleagues on the board for putting this together. Um, uh, hopefully it's gonna be very helpful. I do wanna remind people this is countywide. So these dollars are eligible for North Mankato, Cortland, Lafayette, and Nicollet. Um, and probably some small proprietors that are operating outside the communities. Um, but thank you. Um, and Ryan, like Ryan said, the county is really taking the bulk of, of the disaster or, or the COVID relief and COVID uh, monitoring. Uh, the city doesn't have a Department of Health. Um, so thank you. Um, we consider the county to be a, a, a close partner of the city. Um, county commissioners and city council members have a committee that meet monthly, I believe it is. So we share information. Um, we're very grateful for Ryan and his staff, Jackie and Kathy and the recorder's office are the ones I deal with most, but it's very comforting to know that a block away, we've got a good organization that's solid, that's uh, got good leadership and also does wonderful public service. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Marie. You're, you're, you're free to, to stay on, Ryan, or if you've got things to do, um, have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to uh, leave here, but if anybody has questions, they can follow up with me. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Ed Lee, Chamber of, Chamber of Commerce, you want to talk about marketing efforts and maybe touch on market fest? Yeah, I just want to thank all the partners and um, everybody who's helped keep uh, things afloat during the uh, pandemic. It sounds like we're getting an echo. I'm not sure where that's coming from. So I will try to speak quickly. And if the echo is driving me crazy, I'm not sure what to do about that. But uh, our campaign right now is called Shop Safely in St. Peter. It's uh, fueled by EBA dollars. We support them with a, a, a pitch proposal of how we would spend those dollars. Uh, the EBA unanimously approved our plan. Now just hold on a second. Caller one, could you mute your microphone on your phone? I believe that's where we're getting the, the echo and the feedback. So I don't know, I can't identify who caller one is, but uh, if you'd be able to mute your phone, because uh, I think we're picking it back up. So, sorry, Ed. It makes me want to sing the old song, you blowed it all away. But however, with that echo and that song, I corrected with in 83. Sorry, I digress. That echo is still there, but uh, I'm living with it, and I'll live with it. 
I'll just uh, rattle through my notes here quick and uh, get her done. Um, the message in our campaign, which is going out on traditional media, TV, radio, newspapers, and a lot of social media also. It sounds like the echo is gone. I liked it better with the echo. I was able to mute caller one. <laughs> Because I'm administering the meeting, so if caller one, you want to comment, I'll turn you on back later on. But I think that's where the echo was. That's great. So our message is, uh, you know, stores and restaurants are taking steps to make their venues safe. The big boxes have been open all along. Our hardware stores, grocery stores, liquor stores, and our stores, downtown, retail, restaurants, can be every bit as safe, if not safer. There's plenty of distance, plenty of space in their square footage to encourage that. And so we wanna send out that message that uh, the businesses here are taking steps to be safe and um, jump through those hoops. And we want the shoppers who are uh, safety minded to come to town. You know, the ones who are willing to sanitize to keep the employees of our businesses safe. So that's kind of our target. It's hard to target them you know, in a pinpoint directly kind of way, but uh, but we're doing it with our Shop Safely campaign. Um, it's an investment, like I say, of $10,000 with traditional media and social media. To brand it all, we're using an image of flowers downtown and the architecture in the background to convey our history, character, and charm. We have a unique shopping scene, an incredible, um, shopping situation and experience destination. We're so appreciative of the city for all the work they've done on those plantings downtown. They always look great, but I gotta say 2020 has really stood out. Dan Knight, Kelly Henry, um, those are a couple of the people we see downtown. I think uh, they've had some of the leadership in that. And of course, everyone who waters the plants, everybody. Um, it was no mistake, we were very intentional with our photo, our branded photo, that we have no cars or people in that photo. And that's to convey um, open spaces and distancing. So um, we think and hope it's working. This is the second week of, uh, or the, the second Market Fest is about to take place on the 12th. Uh, that's this Saturday. Our timeline for spending these dollars, investing these dollars, advertising dollars is August, September, October, and that's parallel with Market Fest and Farmers Market. So there's always other groups that we partner with, whether it's the ambassadors with Oktoberfest and um, St. Patrick's Day or uh, Rock Bend Folk Festival or the Car Show, anything going on at the fairgrounds. We always try and partner with them and support them. So many things have been canceled this year, and that's just too bad. But Market Fest is happening. The farmer's market is happening, so we're encouraging people to come to town and shop safely. Um, we're really pushing the Nicollet County Cares Act grants and getting out to businesses to do that. We're selling a lot of chamber bucks, I would say at least $10,000 during the pandemic. Um, today we have a couple of Zoom meetings. We have two in-person meetings. We have three visits before 8 a.m. Some other things the chambers are, are doing. We're doing a September Stick Togetherness event, which will be a drive through on the 22nd from 11.30 to 1 to thank our members, to thank the community for uh, sticking together. So watch for a postcard in the mail about that. Um, we're here every day. We've been here every day in uh, 2020 throughout the pandemic to uh, welcome whatever visitors pop in and answer phones. And so um, we're really trying to support members and really trying to support the community through this. Um, we have deemed ourselves essential. And we've done that all along. We've been here from 8 or at least 8.15 to past 5 every day, bag lunch in it. So we pop out on errands now and then. But that's what the Chamber's up to. And I really appreciate the time to uh, say a few words. And again, thank you to the city for the microloan program. It helps businesses and now this county cares grant uh, to help businesses thank Russ? you ed thank you very much um uh, it's, it's always nice to work with ed down at the other a little north of the city so um i'm going to talk a little bit about our covid 19 microloan program the city council put that together 
um, held a special meeting on March 30th, adopted the program, and, and we were always proud to say that uh, the next Friday, the 30th was Monday, and on the next Friday, we did the first distribution of, of a couple dozen or half dozen checks. Um, then, uh, you know, we, we amended it from time to time to add business sectors to the eligibility list as they were impacted by governor's orders and, and other activities. Um, the program was closed and applications were accepted through the end of business on August 31st. Um, the Economic Development Authority is an appointed board that the city council and mayor appoint. Uh, does have two city council representatives on it. Um, and so they administer the revolving loan funds and they are uh, an advisory board to the council. So they make recommendations to the council who has to take the final action. Um, as, as with Nicollet County, the city did receive CARES funding directly from the federal government. Um, we received 901,000, you gotta get closer, 597. <laughs> So $901,597, um, that can reimburse the city for costs that we have incurred um, to handle and deal with the COVID situation. Um, at, at Monday night's city council meeting, the council had a discussion about the, the, the use of those dollars. Um, and there is some consideration that the loans that the city had made uh, will be converted into a forgivable grant. Um, so if you received a COVID-19 microloan, um, it is possible that the, that it will be converted into a grant and you would not be able to, or not be able to, you would not be required to repay that as per the terms of the promissory note that you, you signed. Um, the city's intent had always been that these would be a 0% deferred repayment grant or loan. Um, and and so uh, if we do have the ability, the city council is going to be looking for a recommendation from the Economic Development Authority. Um, but of the $901,000, and if you go to the, the last uh, council agenda that's available on the city's website, the very last page has an accounting of what the city has incurred for costs so far. And and we really can only identify, it's, it's about $60,000. And that includes, uh, um, you, you know, the $10,000 marketing fund that we provided to, to the chamber, um, the meetings that, that we've had the expenses for getting the go to meeting software, some plexiglass, um, some legal cost review policies, but, but there really hasn't been a lot of true cost incurred by the city. So um, if they were to provide forgivability, um, we'd still only, uh, we'd still have about $307,000 left. And, and as I understand it, if those expenses aren't incurred uh, prior to the end of the year, that, that the, we will coordinate with the county. And I think there's a mechanism where we're, we're, uh, we're to turn that back over to Nicola County, but we will be reimbursed for every one of the city's expenses that we've incurred. Um, I'm gonna open it up. Oh, let me do, do say, if, if it is decided that our, uh, loans would be converted to to a, a forgivable loan, completely forgivable loan. We need to really orchestrate this with Nicollet County so we don't step on their toes um, because uh, our intent would be that they would have their distribution and if the council were gonna make the decision um, uh, on ours, it would be done after the fact. So um, they may have a recommendation from the EDA as soon as the 24th of this month when their meeting is scheduled. Um, but again, any action that the city um, takes will, will be deferred until the county is completed with their distribution and their program. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions um, for me or or even even for Ed. So if you got a question, go ahead and turn your microphone on. I don't see many on here that did receive a COVID loan and, and a couple of the names I, I don't recognize, but that's okay also. So um, one more time, I'll give you an opportunity to ask a question. If not, folks, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, like, like we've said, from time to time, we may look to assemble, but I think um, um, at your best choice from this point would be to participate in one of the, the county's uh, web-based uh, uh, informational sessions that they're going to have. Uh, Marie, I wanna commend you for bringing in Baker Tilly. Um, you know, they, they do a wonderful job and, and uh, they provide a lot of different services to government. So I'm um, having them uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have it done, uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, very efficiently and effectively. So 
everybody. You have a wonderful, uh, I guess we're still in the morning, but have a wonderful day. Stay safe and stay very well.